Welcome back, everybody, to Constructive Uncoupling, the podcast devoted to amicable divorces. I'm Judy Weigel, your amicable divorce expert. Why? Because that's all I do, amicable divorces. My whole thrust and goal in this business, Divorce Resource, and in this podcast is to show people how to have amicable divorces. And the bottom line in most of this is how we communicate. So today's podcast is about this topic, believing the ideal rather than the reality in front of us. It's the way we get through life. It's how we justify our choices. And it's what makes us go off track and wrong. It has to be changed. So divorce is no different than regular life. It is part of regular life. And in regular life, as in divorce, people will sooner believe the ideal in their heads as opposed to the reality in front of them. We see it in the concessions we make when we choose who to marry. And then we subsequently make so many concessions in order to accept ill behavior from our spouses in order to stay married. I understand why we try and make marriage work. I mean, it's understandable. It's a big step. If you have children, you don't want to disrupt the family dynamic. But to marry somebody who we kind of, sort of know isn't right for us, initiates our journey of believing in and wanting the ideal in our heads rather than the reality in front of our eyes. I filed for divorce a few years ago for an absolutely beautiful, lovely, sweet girl in her 20s. We'll call her Samantha. Interestingly, Samantha's second marriage, and again, she was only in her 20s, um, she, she filed for her second divorce. She shared with me why she was getting divorced. He was hugely controlling, had anger management issues, and punched her in the stomach right before the wedding ceremony started. Now, let me just stop here a second. You cannot imagine how many acts of violence occur for the first time on the day of the wedding. I'm not a therapist, but I'm going to guess that it is one of the highest emotional days we'll ever experience. And if we're not ready for marriage, if we're not ready for that emotional commitment, we start acting out in ways that are surprising to our soon-to-be spouses. And I have heard of many situations where people have experienced for the first time physical violence right before they walk down the aisle. This particular wedding took place at one of the most expensive, iconic hotels in Beverly Hills with 350 guests. Out of a feeling of obligation, Samantha walked down the aisle after being hit in the stomach by her soon-to-be husband. Everything went downhill after that. He became angrier, more controlling, and violent from that day forward. Understandably, you're in the moment when you're on your wedding day with all of this activity and drama unfolding around you, and now you're so completely shocked that your soon-to-be husband would physically assault you on this beautiful day that your mind just can't process the logic. Your amygdala has been hijacked. Now, do you know what your amygdala is? Your amygdala is that part of the brain and it's right center where your forehead is that processes logic. You're already in a world of future plans with your Prince Charming as you're living out, in this case, your second fantasy. Again, this was her second marriage. And I think that's important to this scenario that it was her second marriage and to this topic believing in the ideal rather than the reality in front of you. So keep that in mind as we're going through the story. But what I wasn't prepared to hear from Samantha as we were filing for the the divorce was that she wanted to reconcile and made excuses about why 
her supposedly soon-to-be ex-husband displayed violent behavior on the wedding day. And all we do is this. We make excuses for extreme ill behavior. And this is just a classic example of that. Samantha had to accept that her husband didn't and couldn't treat her the way she, would, she wanted to be treated without physical and emotional abuse. Obviously, doesn't everybody? There is something inside of him, her husband at that time, that prevented him from acting in a loving way. Her communication had to be her protective shield. With good communication, we can position ourselves in such a way that we become strong, independent people who make good choices going forward for ourselves and change our present circumstances. Go from the ideal in our heads to the reality in front of us. But listen, we do this with ever, so many other aspects of our lives, don't we? We do this in politics, with our employers, with our religious beliefs, and with our friends and family. We have this ideal of what we want and what we can have based on the choices we make because we are convinced that our choices reflect reality. It's very difficult for us to accept that people who we choose to put in our lives can be mean, can be nothing that we thought they were, and may not care about us at all. I've often said that our political parents the politicians we vote for, and we look at them like our parents. They're going to take care of us. They have our best interest at heart. Why? Because they're in the party that we choose to be in. It is very hard for us to believe that our political parents don't love us. It's very hard for us to admit that we may have made an incorrect decision about someone we voted for simply because they are representing the party we belong to. I've said for years that our political parents don't love us because when they get to office, they don't behave in a manner that helps us. And they don't vote for legislation that benefits us as they said they were going to. You have to understand, though, and this goes back to the divorce topic, you have to understand what drives a politician like what drives our spouses, what drives a politician to want to be in politics, just like you have to understand what drives our mates to do what they do that is untoward behavior. We complain daily about our employers, another example, but we continue to go to work for them. We continue for years to be dragged down by what we consider to be unfair treatment by our employers, but yet we hold ownership over our jobs. It's my job. Nobody can take my job away. It's unfair. What do you mean leave our jobs because we don't like what our managers or the, um, the owner of the company does? Why should I leave? Well, because it's not your company, first of all. And because, why on earth, regardless of all the laws in place, would you want to put yourself in an environment that doesn't nurture you, that doesn't make you feel good? Why would you want to do that? Because we have an ideal in our heads that negates the reality in front of us. And then when we're let go, we become indignant when it's probably the best thing that could have happened to us, forced change. And I say to everybody who comes through my doors to get divorced, divorce is a new beginning. You may not like the idea of getting divorced, and it may not be your decision. But trust me, if you use this for your benefit and for your growth, it can be the best thing that's happened to you. Friendships. We continue friendships with people who mistreat us. We speak badly of our friends, yet we stay friends with them. Just watch all the Bravo uh, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Orange County, New York, Atlanta, Potomac, you go on and on. They say they love and respect each other, while they shred each other to death. 
Yes, it makes for good television, but it certainly doesn't make for good relationships. Look at Tamara Judge and Vicki Gunvalson from Orange County, fighting constantly, yet they love each other. Professed love. Ramona Singer and everyone else from New York, she fights with everyone. Yet she says they're her best friends. Kyle Richards and Lisa Vanderpump from the Beverly Hills Housewives, well, they finally split up. But how many times did Kyle Richards go to Lisa Vanderpump and tell her how much she loved her while she's telling her how badly her behavior is, how bad her behavior is? Why stay friends if most of what you say is negative, meaning you mostly have a negative relationship? Just like, just like marriage. The ideal that these ladies are friends when their behavior is anything but friendly dispels the ideal into a different reality. I have a current example for you. I I'm so sorry. These housewife shows are truly my guilty pleasure. I go from listening to divorce disputes all day long to turning on the TV and looking at these real life characters who you can go and do business with if you choose act out on TV what I'm dealing with in real life. So we have Emily from the Orange County Housewives on Bravo. Emily is in her second season with this show, and we saw from last season that her sh husband Shane had some socialization issues. He didn't play well with the other housewives uh, when in a position of entertaining or being entertained. But what we're seeing this season is that he truly mistreats Emily. He's rude, abusive, dismissive, and unloving. Emily constantly makes excuses for his ill behavior and accepts it for herself. But she's, she's kind of not doing it now. She's breaking down. They have three children, I believe. So I get that divorcing can't be the first alternative. But he just didn't turn into this little... He just didn't turn into this toad of a person treating her. He had toad behavior before this season. It's more pronounced now, and Emily, it's not going to change anytime soon. Because I don't think he can, at least not right now. He has to first realize that he's being hurtful, and then he has to want to change. Maybe he can't change. Maybe he has a personality disorder that needs special treatment. Maybe he's so unhappy that he can't be right for anyone until he gets right for himself. So Emily needs to change. Emily needs to communicate with him in such a way that he understands that he's exhibiting inappropriate behavior and she needs to create her own change to show Shane that she will and won't accept his behavior. We think it will all get better on its own, but it doesn't. Why? Because it can't unless the employer, the politicians, and our friends come to a different reality about themselves and want to change whatever behavior makes them unhealthy people to be in relationship with. And that is something that we can't influence except through communication. We can't make people want to change or even recognize that they should change. They have to come to these decisions themselves. We, on the other hand, can change our choices to be around people who don't treat us well. Bottom line, the sooner we can accept that we made an incorrect choice in our mates, our friends, our employers, and yes, our political parents, the sooner we can support our health and happiness, and live in reality. And honestly, reality is a much better place to live. We have to be the ones who change, or we will continue to live in a false reality. I have another story. A colleague of mine had a client who, in the middle of filing, voluntarily told her that years before that, when she was just married, and they were married for 18 years. She came home early from work one day and found her husband in the living room with another man, and they were both naked. I really can't make this stuff up. He said that they were exercising. She accepted that, 
and they stayed married for 18 years, but without having sex. And by the way, I've had another client who was married for well over 18 years and never had sex and made excuses for not, not having that as part of their marriage. She accepted this, this reason for social nudity as the reality. I believe because the ideal for her was that she was not married to, she needed, her ideal needed to be that she wasn't married to somebody who was gay. She wanted to believe that ideal so much that she normalized not having sex for the entirety of her marriage. They were actually good friends and remained good friends throughout the filing process, I'm told. When they came to my colleague's office, she said they were sweet to each other. But holding on to the ideal, and this is what makes this story a little different, but holding on to the ideal was preferred by both of them over accepting reality. When the reality of the husband being gay replaced the fantasy of the ideal that he wasn't, that's when they actually got divorced. But isn't this interesting? that as opposed to all the other relationships where ill behavior is attempted to be normalized so that you can continue living the fantasy that I'm in a good marriage, these two people created an ideal that was not truthful, but it was preferred by both of them, and because of that, they actually treated each other well. And so there are other marriages that I deal with that really didn't work for a while, but the two people weren't, didn't treat each other with animosity. They actually treated each other like friends. And so that situation was better than the reality of getting divorced. So not every situation is the same, but eventually the ideal has to be replaced by reality. It always is. Why? Why is the ideal a better choice than choosing reality for those of us who suspend the functionality of our amygdala, the logic center of our brains? And here's the big reason. Because it requires us to change. It requires that we admit we made an incorrect decision, whether we had clues and saw signs before our situations became critical or not doesn't matter. What matters is that as soon as possible, when we see reality, we create the change necessary to live in reality. And this is where divorce comes in. Divorce isn't terminal. No one dies. Well, unless something horrible happens to us. But these in incidences are truly in the minority. Best choice is to not ignore warning signs. If something about the behavior of someone with whom we're in relationship doesn't feel right, reassess. What did Oprah's friend Maya Angelou, the poet and teacher, say? When people tell you who they are, believe them. Not just in words, but in behavior. People tell us who they are. They behave in certain ways to show us they're either really nice really focused on us, really want to make us priorities, or they don't. Believe what they do. What they say doesn't matter. What they do means everything. The husband who hit Samantha in the stomach before they walked down the aisle at their wedding, he told her who he was. Emily and Shane from Orange County Housewives, Vicki and Tamara, Kyle and Lisa, Ramona and everyone else from New York, and the people we voted for. Admit there's something not right about these relationships and then do something about it. Change. Now, where do we start the change? That's the important aspect of this. Communication. And it's always about communication. Communication is one of our best friends when we decide to change. Communicate in a way that doesn't blame, but that states what you will and won't accept. There's no need for blame. In fact, blame muddies the values of good, clear communication. Starting from I, what I need, what I see, what I would like. 
when we blame the other person, all they hear is that they were wrong and they go into defense mode, thus preventing them from hearing what you're communicating, which is the change that you're about to make for your own health and welfare. Let's take some of these examples I provided today and role play communication. Samantha and her ex-husband, toughest example of all. She was ready to walk down the aisle. Hundreds of guests were waiting and hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent on the wedding. A violent act was committed. Her soon-to-be husband just hit her. What were her options? Well, option one, saying to him in the moment that she can't marry a man who hits her even on the day of their wedding. <clears throat> okay, this is super hard to do. So you're in this e enormously emotional moment. You're nervous anyway. You want everything to start. In Samantha's case, it was her second wedding. She really wanted it to work out. And you're supposed to think logically. I think that's not practical. I think, I don't even think that I would have done it. I can't imagine somebody saying we're calling off the wedding. You have to be so in control of yourself to be able to do that that I don't think most people can. The other option is ask your mother and father to come to your dressing room so that you can ask for their direction. Well, what would mom and dad do? I actually did work with a couple and this happened to the girl and mom and dad came in the dressing room and said, look, there's nothing we can do. We'll lose a ton of money. We'll, we'll get nothing back. Um, yes, you might be able to work this out. Did this ever happen before? No, mom, it didn't. I didn't really see this coming. Okay. I would venture to say that most parents would, first of all, dad may go into complete crazy mode and want to deck soon to be husband or go into soon to be husband and say, if you ever touch my daughter again, it will be the end of your natural life. I mean, things like that really do go on, right? I think that's a very tough decision for everybody on that day. It really, really is. And what if it's the first time this man ever hit anybody? Maybe he's in shock that it happened. I, you know, there's just so much to deal with. And you have these guests and the band and the presents and the caterers. I would expect most people would let it go on. Well, then there's the other choice. You let it go on. You realize there's nothing you can do about it right now. And you have part two, the honeymoon. Okay, so do you let your daughter go on the honeymoon? I mean, all of these logistical steps have to um, go into place. Do you let her go on the honeymoon? Do you say, let's do the wedding, let's cancel the honeymoon, let's get you into therapy, let's sit you two down and talk. It's less money canceling the honeymoon than it is canceling the wedding. I mean, there's all of this to consider. But in the end, Communication has to state what Samantha will and won't accept going forward. So here's an example of what Samantha could have said as soon as she was able. Whether it's the wedding day, uh, in place of the honeymoon, during the honeymoon, after the honeymoon. But here's just an example of communication. I have no idea why you hit me. I am very interested in why you did that. If I can help you in any way not react so violently when words and behavior trigger you, I am open to helping. But in no way are you ever to speak to me or become physically aggressive with me again. You have no right nor invitation to hurt me physically or verbally. I will file for divorce if there is another incident and I will absolutely report it to the police. Okay, so at any point in time, that could be stated. There was no blame. There was only Emily, I mean, there was only Samantha talking from her own position of what she will and won't accept going forward. And that 
done in that way allows the other party to absorb what you're saying. And if there is a personality disorder, if there is something dysfunctional about the person and they can't at all understand what you're saying, then you've got to run screaming, get that divorce, get that annulment, do whatever you have to do, get out of that relationship. Okay, so for Emily and Shane from Orange County, bearing in mind that I can only react to the edited footage on the show, so, you know, I have, to under, I have to keep that in mind. But there have been enough examples in season one and now in season two that I can suggest some communication examples. So example number one, a little background. In season two, Shane has been studying for the bar. He failed the first two times he tried to take this test. And by the way, his parents passed the bar first time around. This in and of itself is stressful to the person taking the exam. And when you're a husband and father of three children with a working wife, and by the way, Emily is an attorney, and she passed the bar the first time around, breaking off from the family is tough on everyone so that he can study for the bar. Under all of this pressure of everybody in his family has already passed the bar. So maybe Emily could have given him more space and time alone to get through the task on the show. It appeared that she was needy and called him maybe more than she should have. Shane also appears to have a short fuse. Seems like there might be a judgmental attitude that could be covering up lots of insecurities. It also doesn't look like Emily's values comport with Shane's values. Shane is a Mormon. Emily is not. Perhaps they both appear to be miserable, and they really do both appear to be miserable, because they're unsuited to be together. Ideal versus reality. Emily wanted to, for example, dance nude, oh my God, dance nude in Las Vegas for Shane for their upcoming wedding anniversary. Okay, so apparently you there's this nude dancing. Well, you know what they do with nude dancing for the public in Las Vegas. They really do have these like nude cover-ups. It makes it look like you're nude, but you're not really nude because there are all kinds of laws even in Las Vegas about that. But guess what? Shane didn't like this idea. Right on, he's a Mormon. She's not. In reality, they have different views of life. So how might the communication go if Emily wanted to deal with the reality that they don't think alike? An example, Emily. After, well, what Emily could say, after 10 years of marriage and three children, Shane, I don't know if we were ever suited to each other or we just grew apart. But I need to be in a relationship with a man that I can communicate with. A man who doesn't dismiss me when I want to get close. It also doesn't seem like we enjoy the same things. Maybe it's the religion. Maybe it's the lifestyle. But whatever it is, I would like to determine if spending the rest of our lives together will bring us joy. Now you have a reality-based conversation. And it's all about that. It's all about reality. The clients who stayed married without having sex. How, how many heterosexual men, I ask you, do you know who sit around in the middle of the working day nude? How badly did the wife want to deny reality? How badly did she want to stay in the marriage? How badly did he want to stay in the marriage? In this case, denying reality seemed to be what they both wanted. They both voluntarily stayed in the marriage and remained friends throughout. It was the wife's choice to live in a marriage that ceased being conjugal. When it was time for them to both move on, they did it without apparent animosity. There is no suggestion for better communication here because choosing the ideal rather than the reality created, created their own reality that served their purposes. But let's just say that's not what happened. Let's just say the wife chose to believe her husband was gay. All she would really have to do is just say, look, 
there's nothing wrong with being gay. It's okay. I like you. I think you're a wonderful human being. I just need to be in a relationship with somebody who's a heterosexual. And I do think their religion, now that I'm thinking about this, I think their religion had something to do with it. And if either of them had gotten counseling, here's legal counseling, here's what they would have found out. And this is for both, for any of you to know too. People who do not believe in divorce because of religion get legal separations. So you can file for legal separation as opposed to divorce which means you divide all of your community assets and debts. You go about spousal support if it's going to be part of the equation. <clears throat> Excuse me. But you can't remarry. So you stay true to your religion by not remarrying. You just live in separate households and you don't create community property. Now, depending on people's religions, I don't know, maybe you won't have another relationship. I mean, a relationship that's conjugal, but in which you don't um, remarry. I mean, you really have to look at the fine points of your religion in that case. But there could have been a different conversation. And just dealing with the reality of, I'm okay with you being gay. You're still a wonderful human being, and I love you. I just really want to have a conjugal relationship with somebody. So that's if that was the issue. Apparently it wasn't. The other reality show housewives on Bravo, they really do represent people who stay friends with people who they talk smack about. This begs the question, how do people define friendship? What are the rules for friendship? Where's the line, if there is one, that you can't go over in terms of adversarial behavior that negates or tarnishes the friendship. How does this translate to divorce? Well, if we find our communication about our spouses to be more negative than positive, like these Bravo reality shows, is this a reality that we find productive, nurturing, healthy, and the ideal to which we originally aspired? If your answer is no to the ideal to which we aspired or you aspired when you got married, yet is the reality you're living with in as the marriage progresses, the communication has to be an inner dialogue with ourselves first to see why we're choosing to remain in this marriage or friendship. <clears throat> and once we have a reality-based inner dialogue, it's time to share your thinking with your spouse. Should we stay or should we go? You can ask. Once this decision is made with a focus on the reality, not the ideal, of your relationship, you have just adjusted the reality to be equal to the ideal that you would like to have. And that's how we change relationships that are counterproductive to happiness into realities or into realities that work for us either within the relationship that we're in or with a future relationship. Well, that's what I've got for you today, believing the ideal rather than the reality. Thank you so much for joining me on our podcast, Constructive Uncoupling. I'm Judy Weigel, your host. You can reach me through email, Judy, J-U-D-Y, at constructiveuncoupling.com. Judy at constructiveuncoupling.com. Thank you so much, and I'll talk to you in our next episode.